What are different experiences that we all can watch one another do or do collectively as a team? Hello, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, I interview peak performing world changers in the creative, social impact, and vegan spaces. If you like what you hear on this episode, you're going to want to check out the bonus mini episode that you can access if you DM me at Isolde T on Instagram and you let me know you want it. You'll get access to bonus episodes, new art, my latest writing, and other fun benefits. And now, let's get to the show. Hello, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. Super honored that you're here. I'm also super honored and thrilled to have my guests this week. Check out Melissa Lopez and Ryan Shortle. First of all, Melissa Lopez currently serves as the CEO of Positive Adventures and CEO and co-founder of Onyx Offsites and Trainings. She continues to be the driving force behind Onyx, playing an instrumental role in growing the brand and providing resources for corporations of all sizes. Prior to joining the Positive Adventure team and launching Onyx, Lopez utilized her 25 years experience in the marketing industry to launch her agency startup with three other businesses partners in 2013. Under her leadership as co-founder and CEO, Katana, ooh, great name, was recognized by San Diego Business Journal as one of the fastest growing private companies in both 2017 and 2018. That's one. Ryan Shortle is the executive chairman and co-founder of Onyx Offsites and Trainings and Positive Adventures and the driving force behind the brand's mission. Recently named Community Leader of the Year for 2013 by Meeting Professionals International San Diego, Shortle breaks down the humdrum of the traditional. Passionate about helping communities, organizations, teams, and individuals realize their productive of power and capabilities, he uses insightful, purpose-driven techniques delivered in a unique way. Now, together, they form the core of Onyx Offsites and Trainings. Onyx is a new corporate concierge team-building company. Excellent. You know how much I love that. With a mission empowering businesses to create meaningful culture, connection, and change, catering exclusively to companies and corporations. Corporations? My brain is fried. Cor Let me try that one again. Catering exclusively to companies and corporations. Onyx offers team building, offsites, retreats, virtual programs, and a whole lot more. Melissa and Ryan, thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Thank you so much. Appreciate the opportunity. It's a pleasure, and thank you for having us. So let's let's get right on into it. I first of all, I love that that you're doing this and I love what you're doing, but I would love it if you'd go into it a little bit and tell me why Onyx, why now? Why did you start it? What were the reasons that you decided that this is the time to begin? You're both successful in your own right. You're doing things separately, but you've come together to do something that I think is very special, but I'd love to know what the reasons were for it and what your vision is for it. Well, I think Ryan here, I think sometimes life is about timing, being in the right place at the right time with the right people. And when those things align, great things do occur. And sometimes mm. you're more, more or less witnessing how well it's coming together as opposed to forcing it to come together. Originally, I had done a lot of traveling as a younger man, trying to figure out my purpose in life and how I wanted to give back to the world com coming from parents who were involved in service. My father was a lieutenant colonel and my mom was an army nurse and social worker. And so giving back had always been a huge component of my life. And so I had built a company where we were giving back and working with a lot of students, which then developed into working with a lot of corporate groups. And, you know, I had, I had seen that the world had a lot of trouble and a lot of conflict. And a lot of it comes from misunderstandings, communication breakdowns, and not really understanding or seeing the light in, the, in each of the people that we're, we're coming across. And so that's where I've kind of discovered that the workplace is where we spend the majority of our, of our adult life. Mm. And you want to feel trusted, you want to feel supported, you want to feel that your contributions are making a difference in the world. And we saw that there was a lot of conflict and frustrations and turnover and challenges. And then as the pandemic occurred, we recognized that it would have to be in our best interest and for our community to stop what we were doing and redirect our energies to really help the people that were struggling and coming into hybrid offices. And so that was the, the origin story of wanting to come together for Onyx was seeing that 
there was an opportunity to help in a greater way than what either of us were doing individually. And, and I, I can quickly add there too, you know, Ryan and I had a, an opportunity to, to know one another on a personal and professional basis through um, different organizations that, that we were both active parts of. And, and when he said, it's kind of like the stars had aligned and I had come to um, work with him at Positive Adventures. And, you know, obviously, like he said, there was the youth and there was the corporate side of things. And um, it was literally a month before uh, the world shut down for COVID. And so we we looked at it and we said, okay, we can try to salvage what we have, but let's really redirect our energies and our our contributions of what we wanted to be able to give to our, our clients and to the community and um, really identify a way to for like just straight into the, the remote workforce how can we bring these people together? People were in a, a position where they weren't familiarized with the ability to communicate and connect with one another in a virtual environment. And so we started there. And from that, we've continued to evolve and grow. And, and that allowed us to take what was with once positive adventures and evolve it into Onyx with this greater mission. Oh, thank you both. That's wonderful. I, in listening to both of you, the thing that concerns me about we're in COVID, we're still in the pandemic. Uh, a lot of people have made the choice to continue working from home as opposed to, or do a hybrid as opposed to going back to the office. And like you said, it's sort of fractured. People don't know how to do it. They don't know how to work as teams. It's sort of fractured teams all over the world. So what are your thoughts about teams in general? What makes a good team? And also, how do you get people who are in a virtual environment to forge teams or reform the teams that they used to have that they need to have once again in order to innovate and be successful? Well, you know, one of the things that I discovered in almost 20 years of working with businesses is it wasn't actually uncommon for me to work with a team that was partly in Australia, partly in Los Angeles. There have been examples of cross-nation teams for, for decades. Mm -hmm. And so that's what made our position somewhat unique is we already had experience leading hybrid teams, leading Zoom meetings and whatnot but we never really anticipated the, the influx of all businesses going through that. But what it did do was teach us that we had an opportunity to share what we've been learning throughout the years. And so it's just like any other group of human beings, whether it be an orchestra, summer camp staff, or an office, ultimately everyone needs to get together, understand the mission and the vision, have alignment with the values, and then have a meeting rhythm to be able to ensure that there is alignment and forward progression. So offices, when they take the time to align their staff, look after their staff and support their staff, that'll ultimately help the bottom line. But the days of just seeing your staff as cogs in the wheel or as numbers on a sheet, but not the humans is over. And now we see that we have to adapt and adjust to accommodate the working mom of three or, you know, the, the person that lives an hour and a half for their commute. We have to make those adjustments to be able to adjust with the new economy. And I think too, that when, when everyone more or less was thrust into this world of, Hey, we need to identify solutions to be able to work either from a hybrid or a remote um, perspective. Individuals within organizations who didn't have that previous experience of, of working like that felt very isolated. Mm -hmm. And the isolation that I think many of us felt, you know, even whether it be on a personal or professional basis during this pandemic, that's really what drove us to to recognize that let's look at the programs that, that we've been offering previously um, in person and how can we refine and not just connect these individuals on a professional level, but let's ensure that there is an integration of, of te team camaraderie. Let's, let's ensure that individuals have the same goals and objectives in mind. Let's have some fun with them. And there's, there's, there's different ways that we can do that formalized trainings are one, but experiential virtual programs 
that were, would allow these individuals to just kind of come together, even though they're each respectively in their own homes, was paramount. And listening to our clients' experiences has really been very fulfilling for us. And it drives us to identify new ways that we can continue to foster that growth internally for teams that, that happen to be remote. That makes a lot of sense. I'd love to, to piggyback on what you're saying and ask you the following. You talked about this, uh, this feeling of isolation. Can you talk, and I know I recognize that neither of you is a therapist, but can you talk a little bit about that, that the psychology behind the isolation that people were feeling and how your activities and your events help remove that feeling of isolation and bring that feeling of camaraderie? What, are, what, what happens to the people and how are you doing that when you run your events? Well, that's great that you bring it up because as I mentioned before earlier, I had seen some societal challenges in the way society was forming as I was entering into the workspace. And for example, I, I firmly believe that we were beginning to begin our isolation long before COVID where you have uh, communities farther out of the city, the car pulls into the driveway, then it pulls into the garage, then you never really see the neighbor. You have people that are staying at home, taking care of children that feel isolated and whatnot. And then on top of that, then you add in a pandemic where you have a massive isolation. And the thing is, as human beings, we're social creatures. Mm, we sure. evolved in bands of humanity, you know, groups of humans that would move together. And in the turn of the century, we had our aunts and our uncles and our grandparents and our cousins very close to us. And so we, we had... A, a built in support network. But then as people migrated from the country to the cities, moved away from their families in a global economy, you've got people living all over the world now. And it's more difficult to see your mother, your father, your brothers, your sisters, their children. And so you see a greater need for, con for, for connectivity. And in the past, the church served, the you know, church synagogues, religion served as an opportunity to bring people together as well. Um, and, and there have been shifting demographics there. And so where are humans still congregating? Well, they're still congregating around sports teams and they're still congregating at the office and they're still congregating in other associated hobbies. But as I said before, the majority of their time is at the office. And what happens is, is when people feel supported, when people feel connected, then they're going to have greater well-being. And if they have greater well-being, they have greater opportunities for performance. And so if somebody can have somebody else look after their plant while they're homesick for two days, that, know, that teaches that other person that someone's looking out for them, watering the plant, that builds a sense of security, a sense of trust, a safety net. And so the more opportunities we use to build a foundation of trust and support in the office, more likely we will see someone rising to the occasion to support someone else to get something across the finish line, as opposed to seeing them as someone different and separate, they see them as a part of the team and connected. And when all of us are thriving, the whole business thrives. But if only some of us are thriving and some of us are not in the office, then ultimately it's hard to cross the finish line. It's hard to hit the numbers. And so when people are performing together, they ultimately have a sense of trust and they are looking out for one another. And that kind of empathetic approach is what we're trying to teach more in today's current society. Melissa, did you have thoughts on that? Yeah, um, you know, I, I, lo I look at the, I, I take my own personal experience when in terms of isolation and I, I also look back at my previous years within digital marketing, and I worked with team members who worked from their homes, and I had many employees like across the country. But what I found was there was a mass exodus of the workforce that then transpired into individuals who were forced into more or less this isolation and the ability for us Thank goodness, and I, I, I am very grateful for technology to allow 
individuals and organizations to find ways to ensure that we can still see one another and not just see one another, but experience one another. So we really, we really embraced the opportunity of finding ways where we can not just be on a screen and talk and communicate in that manner, but what are different experiences that we all can watch one another do or do collectively as a team, hands-on. You know, one of the things that I will say Ryan had really built positive adventures around was the the art of experiential education. And Mm -hmm. how can you do that when you're in a remote environment, when you're isolated in your your home, you're sitting on your couch, you have your laptop, or you're in a home office, or you're sitting at your kitchen table. And to be able to find different and innovative, fun, engaging ways for being able to, to allow individuals, we did family nights, we did um, where families were able to come together and we sent out pizza uh, gift cards and we did a scavenger hunt and it's a scavenger hunt through the home. To be able to see people engage and laugh, the laughter is really what allowed the, the feeling of isolation to dissipate and that there's ways that we can do things together where it doesn't necessarily mean that you're sitting right next to me. Yeah, you know, and and going into that, I I participated in one of those pizza scavenger hunts with my own children. And it was so fun to see them free and running around and laughing with other children, because at the time, they hadn't really seen a lot of other kids that were beyond their Zoom classmates. But to see all these other families running around was, was really something else. And we know that socialization is essential for the brain neurochemicals that we need to in order to thrive. Mm -hmm. And so the more we socialize, the better. And then lastly, to piggyback off of what Melissa said, there's, there's neuroscience around the fact that when you teach someone, it takes a lot of repetitive behavior, but if you engage them in play, they need a lot less repetition in order to learn it. And so learning through doing is one of the most valuable forms of education because it sticks so well. And most of us have a thousand examples of learning experientially. I could teach you how to ride a bike for two months, but until you actually get on the bike and pedal, we don't even know if what I taught you was valuable. But if I put you on the bike and then we, we ride and, and learn together, we, we know bona fide that you can ride that bike because you've experienced it. You're singing my song, both of you. I love it. I, I, I worked as a master trainer for NASA for many years and doing very hands-on workshops all over the world in environmental education. And what you're talking about rings very true to me because I had, I had the tough one to teach. It was soil. And everyone was like, ew, dirt, until they got their hands in it. And all of a sudden it became, oh, this is the stuff of life. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about any transformations that you've seen, any specific ones that have really been aha moments for you in how you want to keep shaping Onyx as it launches. You know, we have an opportunity to witness and experience transformational growth almost every day of our work. And I, I, love don't, it. I don't say that lightly. And I will share with you the very first ropes, pro, ropes course program I ran. And that's where you have participants way up in the air on cables. There's a lot of perceived risk. One of the very first evaluations I read was, Today was the most powerful day of my life, Mm. second only to the birth of my daughter. And I held that and I read that again and again and again, because I created the ropes course space. I went out and found somebody to bring their team to the ropes course. I facilitated the thing. And I thought I was just kind of going through the motions of my job, but there it was. Here we have, you know, a 45 year old person whose most powerful day of their life was a three hour experience on a ropes course that we facilitated. Now, I don't claim to be the reason for it, but I created a space for them to experience what they were going to experience. And so we see that transformation almost every day. Another example, you know, uh, I had 
two people together. I partnered up two coworkers and I said, in under a minute, find as many things that you have in common. And these two individuals said, you know, laughingly and sweetly that they had worked together for 25 years next, next door in the same cubicle. And they basically knew everything about themselves. And I challenged them and I walked away and a minute later, they were laughing and practically having a seizure and I couldn't figure out why. And they had found out that they were both at the same concert in 1981 in Los Angeles, almost in the same section by the way they were explaining the stage, even though they had both lived in New York their whole life. And so the fact to realize that they were at the same concert 30 years before they ever knew each other is just a small little moment about how you can scratch the surface and learn more about it. And one final example, which throughout the time has been pretty ridiculous, um, this was pre when everybody had cell phones, if you could imagine that, that's how old I am. But I asked these two gentlemen to find as many things that they had in common. And they ran up to me a minute later and they said, man, we have to leave. And I'm like, you just got here. We just started the training. And they said, Ryan, you're not going to believe this, but we just found our wives, high school, best friends that we've both heard about our whole lives. We married the high school best friends. So basically these two women had lost touch, but they had shared stories for 30 years to their husbands about this best friend they had. And both of the husbands put the clues together and realized that both of their wives went to the same high school, the same thing. And they were the actual friends they had heard stories about. And they were racing home to go get their wives to reconnect them because we created a space for employees to get to know each other on a little bit deeper of a level, we actually reconnected long lost friends. Of course, granted now there's Facebook and all, but back then it was a big deal. They were actually racing to go find a payphone. So these are the kinds of experiences that happen where it's not always just, I'm, I'm grateful that, you know, my, my coworker is kinder than I thought he was. Sometimes you can find some remarkable, remarkable connections, hobbies, beliefs and uh you know friendships can be formed that that support last, systems yeah support systems that can last lifetimes wow wow that's really that's cool the space. you have to create the space create the container and then facilitate it and front load it in a way that they're going to get maximum value and benefit from it because most executives will say i don't want to waste any time on on you know benefits for the staff, it's all about the bottom line. But that that old world thinking is is changing. Yeah, I I I love what you're saying, and I the question that comes up to mind because these are obviously big transformations and sometimes small, and you 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 keep saying you have to create the space, you have to create the container. I think of it almost as a crucible. How do you do that? What are the steps in creating the space where people feel safe enough to do these explorations? Well, the thing is, it's just like going for a jog. No, you know, a lot of people wake up in the morning, they don't necessarily want to go for a jog, but they, you know, they're running shoes or by the door. They have a partner that's going to meet them. They have the time set aside and they have the smoothie waiting for them when they get back. Similarly, creating a space for an organization. Generally, what we do is we start with a client needs assessment and we we interview and understand the interested parties, what their group needs at that moment. Sometimes it's a marketing group that actually just hit all their metrics and it's a celebration. Other times there's been a merger and an acquisition and there's two sets of staff that need to integrate. Or sometimes there has been um, turnover of a particular manager and there was some challenges left over after they left. So it's our job to go in and to shed light, not to master. You know, our job is to basically illuminate what it is and what is possible for them as coworkers. But ultimately, they have to do the work. We can provide the platform and provide the opportunity and the instruction um, and include them. But ultimately, people will decide how far they want to embrace those opportunities. And more often than not, more people want to engage than not. There's an occasionally a naysayer in a group when they're talking about feelings or expressions or ways to be more efficient. And that naysayer tends to be the one that has the biggest turnaround by the end of the event. And, you know, it's kind of to feed off of what Ryan had said, just through 
own, my own personal experiences there, some of the programs that we offer, you know, we talk about like team building, we talk, but the training aspect is critical. And for companies to, that have recently gone through a, a, a merger and there is a need for a tremendous amount of, of adaptation in the embracing of change to be able to work with these individuals who are now you know, somewhat segregated, whether you, you're, you're in the same office or you're working remotely or there's, there's multiple people, it doesn't matter. How are you going to be able to effectively communicate? How can they embrace change? And so in that particular client needs assessment, we may go through, you know, let's do a change management training, or perhaps it's something that's a little bit more of allowing individuals the ability to find resilience within themselves. And you, you can talk about a particular topic, but how do you actually apply it into the, the principles and the processes that you as an individual and you as part of a collective team are able to move forward and work together and collaboratively to not just meet your goals, but to feel fulfillment. And so that's really where when the, when we go through those those pre action items with the 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 companies that we're working with, it's important for us to understand the dynamics of who makes up this team. What what are some of the the challenges that you guys have have had in the past? Or as as Ryan said, like are we celebrating something? Is there a milestone? Is there something that is going to allow us to be able to identify the best type of collaborative? team solution to ensure that each person who participates in that in that walks away with a little grain of additional knowledge, additional camaraderie, additional support, and more fulfillment. I'm taking all this in for a second. Thank you both for this. This is uh, so fascinating. The thing that I'm wondering about with what you've said, each employee, each person takes something away how do you handle the, you said the naysayer, I'm going to call it the shy people, the people who are more reticent, more hesitant to be involved in something like this, because it's not their natural personality. Is, do you have, and if so, what are they, strategies to get some of those people who might be not naysayers so much, but just shy, hesitant, what would you do if if a key employee that you knew you wanted to reach was withdrawn? Well, you bring up a great point there because it, it's there is nothing wrong with inherently being shy. And there are plenty of people who don't normally open up. The naysayer is generally someone who is not willing to see the value, doesn't see the value, and is often closed. But what I find is with the people who are maybe quiet or uh, maybe shy is that when you create an inclusive experience and it's facilitated in a way, oftentimes it's the shy person who's been watching the group process who will actually speak up and have the solution. So in, in lighter terms, we often say the male, the male room kid sometimes has the best idea in a group of C-suite executives. But people don't typically listen to the mailroom kid on the hierarchy of a company. But when you put them in a group process and they have to solve a challenge in a certain amount of time, then all voices typically are needed. And that's where the shy person will find their voice and lead because they no longer are watching, you know, uh, braggadocious leaders charge through and plow through things. They're actually seeing that they have something to contribute. And so it's, believe it or not, it's oftentimes the shy people who seemingly thrive the most. And counter to that, occasionally we will um, invite strong leaders to take a step back and that allows others to fill that space. And in so doing, uh, you know, strengthens the group process. And sometimes you know, we'll debrief an activity and I'll ask a strong leader, what was it like having to be pulled back some? Yeah. And they'll always say the same thing. I wouldn't have solved it this way, but the solution that the team came up with was actually better than what I had initially thought. But leaders are often, they often feel like the responsibility is on them and it's a great burden. 
But in good leadership, you can coach the leaders into listening to the teammates. And like I said, oftentimes the voice which doesn't speak up often is the one that has a great solution. And so leaders need to be aware of those quiet teammates. And it's funny too, like it just reminded me as, of something that we had had an experience on for one of our virtual programs. And I think it was probably about six, eight months ago. And we were doing a virtual scavenger hunt and we had this large group. We broke them out into different teams. So I would say the total group was about 40 people. They were broken out into groups of 10. And each of these individuals had, were all from different departments and the company purposefully had worked with us prior to say, we want a diverse group of people in each of those, those breakouts when they're going through um, the, the actual event online. So someone's identified as a captain and the captain is responsible for being the voice to collecting all of the information. And there was this, what was pre-deemed as more quieter developer, worked behind the scenes a lot. Not many people had had the opportunity to, to get to know him because he wasn't someone who was client facing and they also were working in a remote environment. And to hear the feedback of, and to also witness the experience of this individual who was identified as the captain to be able to pull and aggregate his team together and the amount of value for him and in, in the the laughter that had ensued and the, the feedback afterwards was wow we all had got to see a side of somebody that we we didn't even know was part of our organization and to see the way that people think in the way that they express those thoughts in that type of crucial time oriented, okay, daily, but not based on their day-to-day -day activities. And so they're having fun, but they're learning and they're learning about one another. And people who don't necessarily have that voice are put in a position to have that voice and start to embrace that. Again, I'm taking all of this in. I don't want you to think I've like gone off for a cup of coffee. It's just you know, <laughs> no. <laughs> you're giving you're giving such such wonderful, thoughtful answers, and I'm grateful for that. I it's interesting to me when I teach my workshops because I do corporate workshops also, and I teach them through singing. So it's team building through singing, and often the person you had no idea would be this amazing singer because they're quiet or shy or reticent comes out with this incredible operatic voice that no one ever knew about. So it's this this moment of discovery. And I'm wondering in, let's pivot a little bit if you don't mind, in in-person trainings, when you have those aha moments again, you, these people are in situations like a, I forget what you called it, uh, a, a, a rope course, I guess. When when they're there, when they're when they're cheering each other on, how does the team change not just each individual person but how what what characteristics of the team change from before they do something like a rope course or another experiential event to after well i think what happens is is when you put people in novel experiences new activities and events you see certain qualities or characteristics rise up and so in the example Melissa used where you might have a programmer who everybody thought was kind of quiet in a moment of extreme tense, you know, tense moment of competition or whatnot, they rise up to be the calm, level headed organizer and, and group process thinker. And so what happens is, is people, once they leave those activities, they see their coworkers in a new light. And when they see their coworkers in a new light, they remember oh, George was so good at coming up with these creative answers because he did this activity and we were all overwhelmed by it and he came in and really solved it for us. And so what happens is, is people remember, just like you remember, people don't remember the things that you said sometimes that people don't remember the things that you do sometimes, but they'll always remember how uh, you make them feel. And I think that's the unique thing is when someone comes in and solves a challenge or is there to support you or has the answers, but you've been struggling because you're at completely a loss. That's really where you see that that development happen that sticks and it's and it it makes people remember that they're not alone. And I think it's Ken Blanchard who said none of us is as smart as all of us. And so 
it doesn't make any sense for us to have an, uh, an, a company where we do an activity and that's it. Our belief is in transference. And the transference is how did what we do today directly relate back to your work? So for example, what happened when there was only three minutes left in this particular activity and people said, oh, we started spazzing out or we started losing control. And then I said, so what happens right before a deadline at your office? And it's the same behavior mm. because how you do one thing is generally how you do all things. Chances are, if your car is a little disorganized, your office is probably a little disorganized and your bedroom is probably a little bit disorganized. One's not going to be perfectly neat while the rest are a little bit messy. How you do one thing is kind of how you do uh, everything, so to speak. Mm. So with that being said, change occurs and change is real and people can feel that change. And like in another, another example is giving people the tools to understand some personality traits. If you know someone is a relationship master, then you can come to them with an issue that you might have with somebody else. And then they can help smooth the edges so that you don't approach the challenge the way you would have normally had. You rely on other people's perspectives to enhance and support your behaviors moving forward, if that makes sense. It does. It absolutely does. And it's interesting to me in listening to what you're saying, I, this notion of, oh, I didn't know this person had this, this characteristic or this strength or, or this ability, this skill or talent is wonderful. And when, when you're in that space and you have, I don't know how to say this, when you have the, I guess, the opportunity to start seeing how as a leader, you can draw on those skills and talents that you saw after these events, after these trainings, I guess I want to know from, from you both, what, what mindset should a leader be in after they've done this event? What mindset can a leader be in, like a, a what if or an imagine if mindset, I guess, that would allow them to really draw on and focus on the strengths that, that these people have now witnessed in each other so that they can grow their organization or so that they can reach some of those goals? I think that the from a leader's perspective, to be able to witness the individuals and the skill sets um, outside of what their professional position or title or responsibilities within their organization garner them or more or less like put them in a position where, okay, this is what this individual does. But now we start to see different skills. We see different personality tra traits. We are witnessing as a leader, individuals who are rising in areas of expertise that isn't part of their day to day. And being able to identify and look at those as opportunities to bring that team back together and take each of those individuals, a good leader will watch and listen. They're going to observe, they're going to not necessarily be immediate in it, but be strategic and identify when they walk away from those types of, of experiences and see these different opportunities to be able to work on that individual in a professional and, and personal way to help them strengthen that and apply those new newly found skills and and strengths into their existing positions and into other areas within the organization. That's really where you start to see the growth and fostering of individuals within an organization, you're, you're going to be able to give them opportunities that they probably didn't know that that they felt that they that their skill set would be able to um, advance them to. So you get better retention rates, you have an opportunity for building a personal growth plan for these each of these these individuals to allow them for continued contributions into the company continued personal growth and continued um, acceleration within any organization. You know, and I would add on that, there's an old saying, you're, you're not going to learn what you don't want to know. And mm. I, I had an opportunity, I've worked with a lot of sp sports teams, and I had a team that I worked with many years ago. And 
Um, basically, we worked with them. It was impactful. It really felt like a special program. And then that was it. And then a year later, I got a, a card, which, which was you know unusual and nice to have a client from a year ago just write a card. And so I opened it up and said, what you shared with us and what we discovered and learned on that single day, we talked about at every practice. And that got us to win the city championship. And after the city championship, we talked about it at every practice. And that helped us to win the state championship. And then after that, we talked about it and we talked every day in the locker room and every practice and after every game, what we learned on your program. And then we won the national championship. And I'm reading this card. And I'm like, wow, this is great. And then he said, and then we took it to the international level and we talked about it every single day. And we talked about it at our practices and we actually got second place in the world. And we just wanted to thank you because we probably wouldn't have gotten past the city championship without what you helped us to discover. Now, it's those kinds of letters that remind me that ultimately, as my mom would say, it's her job to give her kids the tools, but it's their job to build the life they want. And so we're not uh, snake oil sellers. And at the same time, we don't have the cure for all problems. But what we do have is a perspective and uh, opportunities to reflect what we're seeing and to give space for others to adjust accordingly. And when we make time to fine tune the company, then we make time for the company to perform greater. And that's really what this is all about is when people trust each other, when people aren't in conflict, when they respect and admire each other, ultimately it's better for all the shareholders involved. And if you're gonna put the maintenance on your vehicle, why wouldn't you put the maintenance on your staff? Hmm. Again, I'm taking all of it in. I, the, the thing that I want to, honestly, Ryan, the thing that I want to ask you is, what did you teach them? What, when you were working with this team, what, what were you focusing on so that they had all of these uh, rich things to discuss in the practices and before the games and in the locker room? What was the focus of that? Well, we can begin with the client needs assessment. And then we can talk it through. And when we have a program together, you'll be able to experience it on your own. And then that will be really the true validity of the experience. Me telling you what we did wouldn't be the same as you coming out and experiencing it. So maybe get your team together, your staff, <laughs> we'll have an experience and then your testimonial will be far greater than mine. Uh, I'm a staff of one, so it probably wouldn't be helpful <laughs> to you. <laughs> Uh, no, because the reason the reason that I'm asking is because I imagine some of these are universal themes, right? If you're working with uh, a high school uh, football team, some of the experiences that they might have or some of the takeaways that they might have might be the same as working with a Fortune 500 company, but some would be very different. And I guess what I'm wondering is when you're preparing, what are you trying to achieve and how much of it is the same for everybody and how, of it, how much of it is uniquely specialized in whether or not you're working with a Fortune 500 company or a basketball team or uh, a gardening club. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the scope of your clientele is, but how do you, how do you focus that and what's universal and what's unique to each group? I can jump real quickly. I think that the dynamics of every organization are different, but yet the fundamentals of what you are able to deliver to them can be the same. So every, every team is made up of different personalities, different demographics, different psychographics, and to be able to identify really ultimately what the, the, the need or the outcome is for any type of experience that that team is going, going to go through together, you, you would have the basic fundamentals of it. But overall, we try our best and we do very successfully. We're, we're able to figure out where the, the needs are and customize it to be able to give an overall experience that at the end of the day, you know, would be the same for that high school football team or that fortune 500, but each of the, the program that we would be bringing or the initiatives that we would have them experience would be tailored to their particular 
um, team profile, if that makes sense. Mm, it does. Absolutely. Because, you know, I'm, I'm listening to you both and I'm like, this is so cool. Absolutely. And yet the thing that I, that I'm always focused on because, because this is the innovative mindset podcast is the mindset, right? The mindset that you both have and your team when you're, when you're building these activities and programs, and also the mindset that the people who are participating in them kind of need to have to get the most out of them. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that. What mindset do you have going in and what mindset do you prepare the participants to have so that they get the most out of the program that you're building for them? If we're going to be talking about mindset, we have to understand there are several levels to it. You have the knowledge base, the intellectual base, the social emotional base and, and whatnot. And so the thing is, when you asked, does it vary? I would say first, the bee comes to the blooming rose, not to the tight bud. And so the first thing we have to do is to create a space where the participants can bloom of sorts and to open up. And in that opening, there is greater receptivity. And we get to that opening by creating a nurturing experience that offers challenge by choice. Nobody's forced to do anything. And generally, we start with very simple and easy icebreakers into get to know you's into more formalized um, activities with front loading and pre briefing and then debriefing where we can extract learning and apply it. But ultimately, we have to create a space where the participants can believe that as soon as they stop being who they are they can make room for who they can become. Mm. And that starts with challenging their belief system. And their belief system might be that Greg in accounting is a real jerk until they find out that Greg in accounting also loves scrapbooking and so don't they. And now all of a sudden they can't hate Greg as much because he's got a killer scrapbooking game. <laughs> and so that's part of what we're doing is to find connections and similarities while simultaneously recognizing and honoring each other's differences. And when we honor the differences, for example, Mary's really good at Excel spreadsheets and Juan is really good at creative logo design and terrible at Excel spreadsheets. Juan might be able to go over to Mary and say, I'm trying to do this fundraiser for my kids little league. And I know you're good at Excel spreadsheets, but he wouldn't have maybe had that invitation if the moment wasn't as such where people were openly sharing what they're good at and not so good at. Not a lot of people are willing to stand right up and say, I'm terrible at X, Y, and Z. We tend to hide those things because of fear, shame, guilt, the way we've had conditioning in our family. But the more we're able to articulate the things that we're good at, while simultaneously artic articulating the things that we're not so good at, it allow other people to, to fill in and support us in those roles. And that's where the mindset comes into play. And then furthermore, I try to get our participants to drink lots of water and snack frequently because there's the physical component too of working in an office, not drinking enough water, getting a little snappy at people, skipping lunch, getting angry. And so really we're trying to nurture humanity on the four energies, their physical energy, their emotional energy, their mental energy, and even their spiritual energy. We're not necessarily talking about religion, but we are maybe talking to them about quieting their mind to, Meditation. to embrace the change, to not cling so tightly to the way things used to be done if a new software comes in and how to um, you know, not engage so emotionally if something doesn't turn out the way they anticipated. Hmm. I, again, I'm taking it in. I, ha. Huh. Okay. So you said something that I think is really beautiful, lovely, and fascinating. You're talking about, like you said, the, the, these four categories and physical health is, it's one of the things that, you know, these experiential programs get them, get people out of their seats, get them moving, get them doing which I think is great. And, I, you know, I know, I imagine, 
I know why meditation and mindfulness is important. I mean, I, I, that's what I, that's one of the things that I do is teach mindfulness and teach creativity and all of this other stuff, but, or, and I would love it if you could talk a little bit about why that an employer, a, a leader, a, a CEO, a founder would want that for their people. What would be the benefit? I, I can see what the benefit would be to the people, of course, but what would be the benefit for an employer, for a founder or a leader, if their employees, if their team has that kind of mindfulness training or that kind of physical health that you all provide? I think that it's it's important for any like leader to recognize that a healthy employee who has a great balance from a physical, emotional, spiritual perspective is able to embrace um, differences, embrace challenge, embrace uh, struggles within the the workplace, and you know. A lot of the the clients, I'll bring up like an example that we just recently did. We worked with a a group up in Northern California and we did a 5K and they're really popular. We've done virtual 5Ks, we've done in-person. And this one was just a couple months ago and we did a 5K with a group of about 30 people. And the the CEO, and which I will leave nameless, but a very large Fortune 500 company was running in the race. Mm. And d- doing the 5K along with this, this executive team of his. And to be able to have them all, a 5K is not hard to do, but it is hard to do for some of us, even particularly me. But it's something that can be easily achievable. But the amount of, of, of excitement, nerves, to be able to take all of these th- these individuals and see their leader participating in, in jumping in because of the promotion of physical health, spiritual health, emotional health, connectivity with one, one another. And for them to accomplish that together was outstanding. And for them to each net go back to their groups that they're managing and continue to instill that physical need for for movement for for competition for challenge for them to 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 take it into their teams and now this organization is looking to foster it down because their participants felt that experience felt the the value of what that was bringing to them you know and i i would add that as beings, we're really constantly having a chemical experience. And just as we know that when a hug is embraced for 30 seconds, there's oxytocin that's released when you're holding a baby, it, it, you know, you feel safe, you feel nurtured, you feel secure. The same thing happens, but on the opposite scale, if a boss walks in and yells at you, you develop stress hormones, cortisol, you know, it, it, it starts to run through your systems. If you're hungry, you have more hormones that are running through your system that are angry. Uh, but we know that through exercise, through connectivity, you have a different response of chemicals. And that those dopamine chemicals that come out of you give you a sense of well-being. And what I've learned is the people who I have seen who have the greatest capacity for work, and or stressful situations typically have the greatest capacity to manage those chemical experiences. I work alongside a lot of Navy SEALs and and many people would be surprised that many Navy SEALs are not commanding in presence and powerful in stature. You know, they could be five foot four and 150 pounds. But the, the thing that I think unites each of the Navy SEALs is that they have a mindset which is nearly unbeatable. And that's what makes them so strong is that the way they manage their stress, the way that they manage what they're experiencing. And if you can give coworkers tools to better manage themselves, they will ultimately manage their work and the business better. And that was, I've only had a few bosses in my life being an entrepreneur. But the first real boss that I had, he said, you need to learn how to do yoga. You need to drink green juice smoothies and you need to make sure you take time off in your life so you don't end up like all these hacks that we're working for 
who work 80 hours a week and die at 50 with a heart attack. And I'd been on that path since 19 when he taught me. And we eventually took the mindset that he taught me. And then I penciled that out and we trained every single employee at Rady Children's Hospital, which is the largest children's hospital in the state of California, which is like the sixth largest economy in the world. And all 5,500 employees went through a program that I developed which was solely based on what I learned as a 19 year old with a boss who told me to focus on my health so that I wouldn't end up with a bad back or, you know, cause he's seen it. He was an older man. And he said, if you don't do yoga and take care of your health, you're going to have physical ailments and not be able to feed your family. And if you're not, <clears throat> you know, doing things like yoga and focusing on your breath, lowering your heartbeat and lowering the stress hormones, you're going to just be a wreck and you're going to be yelling and screaming at people. And if you're not feeding yourself with the green juice and taking the time to put nutrition into your body that you're aware of, then your body isn't going to run and perform the way that you need it. And I was very grateful uh, for that kismet relationship and how it turned my life around. And I think that because of that, it's my duty, obligation and responsibility to share that same rewarding experience with the many thousands of participants we work with, because we don't have to suffer. It's our choice. And there are avenues out of it. Once again, you're singing my song. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny you're, men you're mentioning yoga. There are, I've, I've been practicing yoga for almost 30 years. And there's something to me about what you said that feels uh, very grounded, very foundational. This notion of breath, you know, I talk about it with, with, my, with my participants, my clients, that you, you can live three weeks without food, you can live three days without water, you can live three minutes without air. So this notion of breath, this notion of of really getting into that aspect of, of who you are, focusing inward in this way. When you do these programs, when you do these events, how much, what is the sort of division, if you will, of outward participation and inward grounding and, and being aware of, of self? Hmm. It's hard to... I, I think that's really an individualization <laughs> yeah. because as I said before, we usually frame it with you'll get out of today what you're willing to put in or what you're willing to embrace. And some people come through a program and they're kind of crotchety and, and closed off and they leave <laughs> slightly modified and other people go in and have peak experiences and, you know, alter their entire future life. Yeah, so, it's all about what the, that individual is is willing to open their mind up to and and, and accept and bring into to, to to each and everyone individually yeah like i had an example where we were in a program and after the participant walked up and said i'm i'm really prepared to uh leave the job that i'm at she she was at there was a, a retreat but it wasn't for an actual company it was an open enrollment retreat and so i said well, well what does that mean and she says i think i'm going to leave my job and start my own company and I said, oh, that's really great. And then I've only ever spoken to her on that program. And then she went away. Somehow we became Facebook friends and she opened up multiple businesses, multiple things. And it all started <laughs> on this little Joshua Tree retreat. She went in as kind of like a, you know, a, a young lady that was working for somebody else and unsure. And she left the program as, you know, a grown woman boss and just went out there and, and took over. And that was really cool to see because I can't claim that I, I did that for her, but I can say that we created an opportunity for her to discover it on her own. And in that, um, we help foster and facilitate that growth, but that can range on, on any given day on any given participant. For sure. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I tweeted the other day uh, in, in my meditation, I had this realization that came to me and it, it was don't try to convince the unconvincible. And so when you're when you two are doing these as as you launch Onyx, as you are preparing and, and changing the way companies and organizations work together, what are your mindsets? Are you working at it like we're going to try and do the best we can? Are you working at it with specific missions? How are you focused when you're running these programs? I, I, for myself, I just take it back to the 
th what we really say. And it's, it's, it's unfortunately like, you know, every company has a slogan, but it's really what, what is truly in my heart from a belief perspective. My goal and my mission is to create that culture within an organization, the connection, the connection within the teams of the organization and positive change. And if I can keep myself focused and mindful of that for every program that we run to have an outcome for the participants, for the organizations, that they are able to have that connection, that they're able to have that culture enrichment, and that they're able to promote that type of change that will drive the growth and the, the foster the team, then I have been, then I'm doing what, what I have set out to do. And that to me is exciting. And I, I feel fulfilled. Like that's really where my mindset continuously is. And it's far greater to experience the ability to change people, to change mindsets that than doing any other type of, of contribution within an organization. And, you know, one of the things we haven't talked a lot about, but the, a huge opportunity for, for our organization is just getting ourselves back involved into the community, contributing into the, 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 the community, working with organizations that, that we work with to give back. And how meaningful is that? that how lucky are we? I, I, I pinch myself sometimes because I feel really blessed to be able to witness and experience and contribute back into these companies and our, into our community. And I would go so far as to say to the listeners out here, there are some who are quietly suffering. There are some who, who can't believe that this is the pinnacle of life and where they're at right now. The, the dull drums and the hun drums and the angry bosses and the frustrating work environments. My, my goal has always been in life to alleviate the burden and the suffering of others. I saw my parents be crushed under the burdens of life and being the youngest of five kids. And I, I've seen financially, it just ruin people. And I think that the goal is to provide, even for a moment, a respite from the responsibilities of life so that rather than working on the business or on the person we are work rather than working in the business we can work on the business <clears throat> and on the people within it and i think we as individuals don't get as many opportunities to self-reflect to feel nurtured to feel um respected and and safe and when we create that that frame of reference, it allows people to really open up. And in that, talk about some of the things that really challenge them. And, and when you provide tools and resources to minimize the suffering, there's a great deal of gratitude that is paid forward from that. And I think that's ultimately the goal is how do we make human beings just a little bit happier, a little bit more nurturing, and a little bit more empathetic to the people next to them who are also experiencing uh, the trials and tribulations of our existence together. Thank you both. That I love. I love both your answers. This is wonderful, and I'm so so grateful that you have taken the time to be on the show. If somebody wants to learn more about Onyx, how would they find you? Well, they can uh, uh, link up with us anytime. Either Ryan Shortle or myself, Melissa Lopez. Um, our website is Onyx Teams plural, uh, .com. And you can find us on our, our social pages. We've got a, an Instagram, we've got Facebook and, you know, we, anytime that anyone is interested in learning more, Ryan and I always make ourselves accessible and available. We love to have a conversation with yeah, you. Yeah. And if there's a listener out there and this message resonated with you, go ahead and email directly at Ryan at onyxteams.com. I'm always here to listen. I'm always here to support. 24 hours a day, whatever I can do to make you uh, achieve your potential, I, I will do that. 
Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you both so much. And I'm going to put all of your socials in the show notes so somebody can click on it easily and get to there. But I know people learn differently. So I always ask for uh, for people to say what they are. I have just one more question for each of you. And it's a simple question, but I find that it can yield some profound results. And the question is this. If you had an airplane that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? Make time to dance. Live life fully. Ah, simple answers, but see, incredibly profound. Ryan and Melissa, I'm so grateful that you took the time. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I really love what you're doing at Onyx, and I'm looking forward to seeing more about the kinds of programs and exciting events that you are going to plan as you launch and as you continue to help people shine and thrive. Oh, my goodness. Wow. What a great episode. Thank you so much for being here. I hope that you've enjoyed today's episode of the Innovative Mindset Podcast. This is Isolde Trachtenberg. I'm your host, as you know. And as always, I remind you to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and it would mean the world to me if you told a friend about it. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2022. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, remember to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind.